the, the last two sessions that pretty much brought this topic already alive. Um, I'm going to have two great speakers, great uh, backgrounds uh, to involve in these discussions, and hopefully you and your question. You? But please, right now, have a, a big round of applause for Simeon Coney, the P VP of Business Development from Enea Mobile, or where you are, right? and Paul Kavanagh, Chief Revenue Officer from Open Mind Networks. So thank you for being here. Um, it's lovely to have you here, but equally, it's not such good news that we're opening with you too, guys, right? I mean, with all the topics, after the keynote, we're talking about cybersecurity straight away. And we heard it from Mikhail, but we also heard it from Emmanuel, it's, it's been building up. And that quote, 50% of cybersecurity, okay, so let, let's go straight, no more chasing. How bad is things? What's the landscape out there? I'll start with Simeon. Simeon, can you tell us a bit more about what you do, what you see in this market? Yeah, certainly. So, uh, can you hear me? Now we can. There we are. <laughs> Excellent. So um, I'm with Ania. We provide security to uh, large parts of the communications ecosystem. So uh, we're known for firewalls, which are predominantly sitting there invisibly helping protect sort of every bit of communication that goes on, whether it be messaging or voice calls or the signaling that sort of underpins all of the communication infrastructure. And today we're protecting about a quarter of the world. So yes, I mean, in terms of those numbers, I would say that's, that's unfortunately very realistic of what we see. I mean, I think, you know, it, mobile devices are a fantastic enabler for services. Of course, anything that's an enabler is going to be used by other folks who want to then compromise that enablement or reach victims rather than customers. You know, also the, the level of service adoption on mobile devices, you know, we're using it for banking, we're using it for healthcare, we're using it for every aspect. You know, that unfortunately again creates opportunity for compromise. And I think, you know, this is where the social responsibility exists to help ensure that we are doing the utmost to keep those <laughs> services safe. I mean, I've been in this industry for 20 years. You know, the, the advice originally on security always used to be about educate. You know, we are so widespread, we are so pervasive, education is not sufficient. You know, we have to do our utmost in ensuring that every aspect where possible of these services can be safe and secure for every single one of the customers out there. Thank you. Paul, would you like to add something from your perspective? On, yeah. uh, Musk? Sure, sure. I suppose uh, to, to let you know where, where OpenMind are coming from, so three things you should know about OpenMind. So the first is we're specialists in secure messaging, so really our differentiator is our focus. We do one thing and one thing only, and that's uh, secure messaging. Um, uh, the second thing is the company is about 20 years old, so there's a real depth to that specialization. And the third thing really, which is the bit that provides context, is we would have started out primarily in messaging, but our customers are guiding us to enhance our capabilities in two areas. One is in security, which I'll talk to, and the other is in moving out of just SMS-focused messaging to much more broader messaging, so into OTT, into CPaaS, you know, the trends around RCS. So they're the two areas that our customers are taking away from our, from our focus. Uh, it, it's funny, when we were chatting earlier on about the, the big trends that we're seeing, the biggest trend that we see is over 100 years old. It's kind of a random one, right? But what occurred to me is there's a, there's a guy called Willie Sutton. Has anyone ever heard of Willie Sutton in the audience? So he was, he was one of the most prolific bank robbers in the early part of the 20th century in, uh, in the US. And he was known for the sophistication and the variety of, uh, of his bank robbing techniques. Uh, and because he planned them so well, he was actually known for being very calm and very uh, courteous when he was, uh, when he was robbing banks. Uh, he was known for his love of fine clothes. So actually that caught up with him in the end. Uh, because the FBI, he was, he was one of the first guys on the top 10 uh, fugitives for the FBI. They sent his headshot out to uh, draperies and tailor shops, and he was ultimately recognized by the son <laughs> of a tailor who had seen his, his mugshot. And when he was captured by the FBI, they said to him, you know, Willie, why do you rob banks? And he said simply, because that's where the money is. And that's, that's the biggest trend that we see that has gone through the last 100 years. The bad actors are following the money. And the money has moved from desktop to mobile because we know that the open rate for an SMS is 98% versus 40% on an email. We know that the response rate on an SMS is 45% versus 6% on an email. 
We know that SMS is ubiquitous uh, and it's mobile native, so it's getting more attention than OTT. So I think the battleground for the foreseeable future for cyber and fraud will actually be in mobile. That's probably the biggest thing. So we're seeing the volume and the variety and the sophistication of those, uh, those uh, fraud and cyber attacks really, really growing to a massive extent. So, so we would have seen about a 10x increase over the last two years in things like smishing. Um, and because of that, consumers are becoming more aware, media is becoming a w more aware, to pick up on points that, that you made, regulators are becoming more aware. And I think we have to self-regulate because you're right, I think re regulatory actions tend to be very blunt instruments. So they're the, they're the trends that we're seeing, it's just that big move from desktop to mobile and a big shift in the variety and volume and sophistication. So before we heard about crystal balls, so very quickly, you can polish yours, Simeon. Um, what do you see for 2024? It's the season for forecast. Tell me. So, <clears throat> I mean, unfortunately, I think yeah, the number of attacks are just going to go up. As you say, yeah, the money is there. People are falling victim. Um, the level of sophistication on devices, you know, the more capabilities, the more they will be exploited. I mean, the fact that, you know, everybody has now got AI in their pocket you know, the ability to exploit that. You know, for example, um, sending out images, being able to put things in inside an image that now compromises the device is something that we started to see emerge. But it's also not just technology. It can also be social. I mean, for example, there's going to be a rather large sporting event nearby, Ooh. I think, in the, the, the coming months. Yeah. Um, that will be exploited. You know, we will see social engineering attacks. Um, we will see use of things like corporate espionage techniques. You know, the fact that every one is carrying a location tracking device in their pocket, people will utilize the intelligence from that to try and gain unfair intelligence. So a variety of different factors we see will continue to get exploited. Opportunistic attacks, you know, that's the sort of thing, you know, whether it be a natural disaster, whether it be a newsworthy event, these are the sort of things we'll exploit. So combination of technology, social, opportunistic, you know, it you have to be on the ball, if you pardon the pun, to try and work out where those next attacks are coming from. And as, as we heard earlier, you know, utilizing things like AI to try and uh, correlate billions of events every single day to try and work out what is anomalous, what should be the top priority, what is a rising change that needs that focus is critical. Okay. Well, I'll, I'd like to ask you some questions as well. So throw some, well, as Isabel was saying, tough question, don't I say that, but your concerns um, throw out there, what, what are your top concerns on cybersecurity on a wholesale? Nothing, we can go home. That is so good. <laughs> I am so happy about you. No, 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 come it, say it, D don't, don't be shy. I spoke French, so, okay. So I think if I can do that, you, c you can say anything you want. Any, any takers, anybody who wants to provide something? Just, just shout at me. You'll have to provide some. Say it again. Software attacks. For for those at home, we're not live today, as we with uh, a leadership forum. There was a software attack and exploitation of some of the OS or software you know, for yeah. potential policies to get inside. And if you announce on the wholesale traffic, spoofing IDs. spoofing IDs, oh, I was waiting for that. And, and if we got some, they're fit. RCS P2P bypass, that's new, as the RCS is, it's been there for a while, but hasn't been used, we have now seen it. Um, if you can, I'm sorry, I'm gonna be very fast, but if you want, throw it at me or, here we go, Igor. Uh, OTT channels being used by fraudsters to gain access to people. OTT channels, that is over top or wholesale. Anything else? We go, we cover all those three or four. Thank you. Any surprise there? No, no, like that, that's really consistent. Like, so to, to pick up on your point, w one of the threats that uh, Cisco Talos would talk about is uh, the 3CX uh, soft phone attack. I don't know if you would have seen that, but uh, bad actors basically compromised a legitimate uh, software upgrade uh, pack, uh, in, uh, inserted malware, and people were kind of very legitimately up doing what you're supposed to do, upgrade your software, up upgrading their 3CX soft phone, but actually they were installing malware that was, you know, uh, allowing the bad actors to, to, to integrate into, into, um, into networks. Um, I think uh, one of the interesting trends that we're seeing is, uh, we, we spoke about uh, wholesale as a platform and we spoke about the rise of as a service. So one of the big things we're seeing is actually fraud as a service. 
So phishing as a service has now moved to smishing as a service. So there's a wholesale community within the cybercrime world, which is really interesting. And in the in the desktop world, we saw the the, the greatness um, kit where you could literally buy uh, you know a whole. A, you wouldn't have to be very sophisticated as a cybercriminal. You could buy it from a wholesale operator, and they would give you a whole kit with APIs with images that would allow you to uh, to compromise someone's Microsoft Office 365 um, account. It, you know, it would look very real to you. You would put in your username and password. It would trigger an MFA. You'd get the text or whatever. You would fill in that M MFA, and then the bad actors would actually, you know, rob the, the session cookies. We're seeing that move to mobile. Um, uh, tr triad smishing was was a yeah, uh, smishing as a service uh, pr proposition. So we're seeing a lot of those trends come out. That, that mean that very unsophisticated bad actors can leverage greater innovation and technology from up the the ecosystem. So it's, it's an industrialization of a cyber threat. It's not just that they're getting technically more competent, they're getting business-like. That's uh, well, something not to, to be too to be too happy about. Um, Simeon, what else do you think? You've heard some of those, some of the comments or additional things you'd like to add there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I got to say, I caught the train down here. Um, and I think spammers, fishers, whatever, I can't think why, but they just gave me the perfect anecdote, which is um, to the point of sort of phishing and impersonation, I had three spoofed voice calls on the way down. I probably get maybe about one a week. I got three in the space of the two and a half hours I was on the train. You know, this shows how quickly they can adapt. And use, I mean, they were used, trying to use the same sort of scams and techniques, you know, the, the package delivery scams that we all know about on messaging. But they're just taking that same skill, the same investment in the technique, and they're just applying it to new services, new bearers. I mean, the other anecdote that I've got is that before I left, I had to update the software on my security cameras. You know, we, we always think, oh, well, it's just our laptops, our PCs, and maybe our phone OSs. You know, with 5G, there will be so many different interactive operating systems, technology stacks, software-defined radio creates larger attack services, the way that we have OTT apps interacting with users. You know, no longer is it just secure messaging channels under our protection. All of these things are driving into the same inbox or the same user experience. You know, it's just getting a larger and larger, more complex space to try and keep up to date, to try and keep equivalent protection on. I'm going to add a couple of them, um, not that we need discussion, but, you know, we have heard about these problems of identity which is now being, even regulators are getting on it, which is sometimes concerning. We heard what uh, Mikael wanted from his uh, magic wand, and unfortunately, they're all coming, looking at these much more. But what about inflation of traffic? Because we've seen it, it's been around for a lot, it's been around in voice, now in SMS, and now it's the enterprises complaining about that as well. Any quick comment about it, artificially generated? traffic or yeah we'd be seeing a, a, a huge trend particularly in the generation of one-time passwords so i think one-time passwords are estimated to be i think 50 percent of a2p traffic and about 10 percent of them they reckon are artificially inflated uh, it, it's very tricky particularly for a wholesale community because all it takes is you could have one legitimate in inverted commas leg legitimate company within the chain that are setting up bots to generate false one-time passwords for twitter or for one of the big tech operators and everyone along the, the chain from the we we'll call it twi Twitter. Write down is is I suppose is benefiting you know for the for, for the, the movement of the of the text messages, B but ultimately the enterprise is suffering. It's very hard to to see actually who within that chain is is the bad actor, but it's it's a huge issue within one time passwords in particular. And I suppose what we're seeing then is an erosion of trust and a friction in in the service. People start becoming more suspicious of, of the likes of authenticators and one time passwords. And Simeon, you just published. A, a report about the topography, should say, you know, the identification, the definitions of, of that. So what do you think of uh, this type of threats out there? Yeah, uh, one of the characteristics I would say of AIT is that uh, unlike some of the other examples we've been talking about, which are very much external to the ecosystem, you know, the attackers are third parties trying to monetarily gain or intelligence gain. With AIT, we see it unfortunately more being conducted by actors within our ecosystem. Um, yes, there are external elements, but you know the, the cutthroat nature of the, you know, the growing messaging ecosystem out there and the amount of money being exchanged on the global scale of things has meant that we are starting to see more and more bad practices. And in fact, I mean, AIT 
particularly in our research, is not just one specific type of attack. We've actually got seven different types of AIT, some of which are completely invisible depending upon where you're sitting in the ecosystem. So maybe as an operator, things are happening up the chain and actually even being taken out of the chain before it even reaches your network. Likewise, there are certain attacks being generated on end user devices to generate traffic that are invisible to the brand side of things. So yes, it's becoming increasingly more complex, but I think it's a characteristic of any environment where there is scope to try and extract money due to complexity, due to arbitration of pricing, due to the scale and the volume of the traffic that's occurring, people are now using it either for monetary gain or for unfair commercial advantage. Also, we got cybersecurity. It's not just a threat outside. Sometimes a threat inside the industry. Sometimes a threat inside the companies themselves. So there are all the different layers coming there. Well, just to make things more complicated, but uh, fear not. You are here and you can uh, help us to solve all of our, of our problems. Actually, tell us, a bit of a health check. How are we doing as a wholesale industry? What's your analysis, if you were the doctor here? What would you say to this? Uh, start with Simeon now, then we'll go to Paul. First off, I think we are doing relatively well. I mean, I think the first key thing is that as an industry, we are good at talking amongst ourselves. You know, absolutely attackers are sharing intelligence on their side of things. But, you know, we have a number of industry forums. So we've got you know, the MEF, we've got the GSMA, you know, and okay. intelligence sharing is utterly critical to make sure that we are sharing knowledge, insights, understanding techniques, um, discovery to be able to work out how things are going. So I think first off, that is a good metric. Um, I think if we look at the scale of change, that's another good metric. You know, if, if things don't change, it's because they keep working, particularly on a security side. So the fact is that attackers are evolving, shows that we have them on the back foot, we're making it harder. But unfortunately, the attack surface, you know, it, it's getting more complex. That will continue creating more opportunities. You know, the introduction of 5G, 5G standalone, APIs, all of these things are, um, areas that will and can be exploited. So, you know, the drive for enabling new services creates more opportunity. So it is a never-ending game of having to continue catching up. Um, we would probably see it as being a bit of a mixed bag. There's kind of, it's kind of three levels to response in the community. Like the first is companies that are very proactive will implement, you know, uh, AI-based software, manage service-based, uh, you know, services that will really try and combat things like smishing and, and revenue assurance fraud. Um, so one is proactive. The second is where there's a regulatory imperative, where there's not action maybe in a market, but the regulator is particularly strong. Uh, and the third is there are poor behaviors. You know, we would see in some jurisdictions millions of P2P messages transferring between operators, uh, much of that coming from single devices, where it's a very, it's not a nuanced uh, attack, it's very obvious that this is uh, illegitimate uh, kind of P2P and A2P traffic, and it's transferred anyway. Um, so I would pick up on what Mikhail said earlier on, I, mean, I think there is a, there's a responsibility on us as an industry and as individual operators to supply clean internet, clean calls, clean messages to, to our customers. But, but it is a mix, mixed bag depending on the jurisdiction is our experience. Okay, so I felt a slightly more positive uh, reactions for the, oh, well, well done, well done to you all. But there's still a big challenge out there. there that is not to be um, misplaced. Uh, we, we still have a lot of things happening. So let's talk, well, well done also for not selling your own company as a solution. I think there was a very well done. Yeah, with 10 minutes left. Well, we, oh, well, okay, okay. <laughs> Let me get more question in, in that case. Um, uh, can I ask a comparison? Can I ask, how is this industry, the telecommunication, the wholesale industry, compared to some other industry out there that are still exposed to cyber threats? So the, the electricity, the, the water, other utilities, um, more or less, where are we? Um, you, you yeah, I, I, I think per personally better. I mean, you know, there's a, there's a kind of a, a, a truism that said more and more now that every company in the world is a technology company um, and everyone, every company has to think like a technology company because it's become digital, but at the end of the day, by definition, we are technology companies for our, for our whole existence. So I think naturally there's a, there's a, there's a fluency, there's a sophistication, there's a, a, a level of understanding around um, software, around telecommunications. So, so, so personally, I, I think we are better. There are those complexities of the nuances of, of 
inadvertently you could benefit from a revenue perspective from a from a, a an attack or from a fraud um, initiative uh, but overall i think we're better yeah i i think probably the one area where we've seen the sort of the communications industry learn from other industries has been in things like privacy um, you know, we've seen things like the, some of the healthcare acts like HIPAA, some of the financial um, acts as well, starting to bring better awareness and control of the responsibility of customer data. But yes, I think fundamentally, as you say, we're, we're a technology industry, so we understand we came into this thinking more about security. Um, I, I would say one of the weaknesses we have is that a lot of our approaches to security is based upon doing what we did before, applying it in the new world or the new environment. So, you know, a lot of our signaling standards are still based on the same trusted actor approach. Uh, a lot of the protocols are based upon variations of earlier versions with those inherited weaknesses. So I think perhaps unlike some of the... Um, the internet agencies who have been able to completely establish new processes, new protocols end to end, just given sort of the nature of what they're doing and coming in over the top. We've got the legacy of everything is a network. You've got to do things en masse at scale where everybody is trying to do the same things, which creates a bit of an inertia, I feel, sometimes from a security perspective. Okay. Now, I haven't forgotten. Are there any questions from you? before I go forward. Oh, we do. Oh, there are lots of questions. I had so good topics, but no, okay. Well, where do we start? Can somebody help us with a microphone? And then the first, well, I think a microphone coming down there. So if you could introduce yourself, which is, where, where is it? Go? Here we go. Okay. Hello, this is uh, Jeevita Mutu from uh, Tomi at Telerix. Yes. Uh, very good topic. Um, just a comment. Uh, we talk about regulatory um, industries and bringing them in and so on, but where is law enforcement um, from an industry perspective, especially from MEF and other you know, industry associations perspective? You know, we have sort of left them on the side, right? They're on their own trying to tackle these issues, but is there something we as a community could do to bring law en enforcement so that these bad actors are paying the paying the price for doing this? Good questions. As you mentioned MEF, I just mentioned that in our last MEF Connects um, anti-fraud event, we had the Europol, we had the Metropolitan Police, the Home Office, it was a UK kind of uh, flavor as well, but European coming from Europol. And there it was great to see what they are doing. So I think you're right. There is something we should definitely have a conversation going on much more. What do you think about involving their part. Are you talking to the police in your jobs? I don't know. I, I maybe be a little bit parochial. So, so I'm from, from Ireland. I noticed some other Irish people in, in the audience. I, I do see a difference. Uh, I think smaller countries struggle a bit more. M maybe countries that, that wouldn't have, you know, historically had a huge uh, security service kind of generally. Um, you know, struggling with resources. I, I think maybe like traditional security arms of government have been able to pivot you know, from the physical world to the digital world. I do think smaller countries are kind of str struggling that bit more um, with resources, with investment, because it's not necessary, as much as there's increased consumer awareness, it's not ne necessarily a big vote winger for governments, you know, to, to invest in this area. So I think there's a struggle there. I think there is a need for collaboration between law enforcement agencies globally, and then between, you know, like Europol, Interpol, etc., uh, engaging with the likes of MEF and GSMA and, and the industry would be my view. Uh, I was going to say one th one thing that's very notable that we've seen about any sort of discussion on this topic is you know law enforcement by its very nature is national you know it is purely parochial for a particular country and the nature of these attacks is they are transnational I mean we we had a great talk didn't we in June in the the MEF session and one of the characteristics there was they were saying, I think it took about, was it four or five months to build up the connections between the Europol, the Interpol, uh, the Dutch, uh, the, the UK. I think there was like maybe three or four other countries involved just to take down one gang. Now, they said once that's now established and once they now know how to work with each other, then they can leverage that going forward. But I think, though, that is the same sort of scaling problem. You know, everyone is very used to working just in their own environment. And now that we've got these cross-border attacks, that isn't something that the law enforcement community is particularly well geared up to be able to address. We have many, many more questions, but I'll go one. I'll let, okay, well, 
we're going to have a microphone race and uh, one. Uh, Denis Kirzibo from Center Communications. So you touched upon AIT and that resulting basically in lack of trust to the channel. Then previously it was mentioned here as well, you know, P2P fraud in RCS. What would you say could be like one silver bullet to bring back the trust in the communication channels? Because if it's declining in SMS and the alternative is OTT or, or RCS in that sense, but we are seeing more and more fraud there, is there an actual way out for the enterprises who are actually suffering from that fraud? Certainly my answer would be transparency. I mean, uh, unfortunately by the nature of sort of, it's a big complex ecosystem, you know, um, a single message will transit maybe sort of three, four, five, six different hops. I mean, I know we got sort of zero, one hop, but the reality is to get the connectivity for their customer base and that creates a weakness. So I think yes, absolutely a bit more, well, a lot more transparency on who is involved in that chain will start to shed a, little, a lot more light on where these particular problems are occurring. I mean, I think there's an awful lot of sort of head nodding going on in the industry that people know roughly where these problems are, but that's within and that, that's not getting transferred back out to the enterprise or the operator community to really understand that. Yeah, nothing really to add, I'd, I'd agree with that, yeah. Yeah, nothing really to add. Fantastic, and by the way, we, we're gonna be publishing some study we've done they're very concerned for the industry, but it's on the P2P side and what's happening. I'm sure that on the whole, wholesale, equally on the voice side, there are issues. Um, we, for a while, we've been saying as a, a MEF, maybe you want to review some of your uh, volumes approach and some of your contracts, they, because you might want to keep some of these very scary enterprises. They can see no end to the demand. That also has played up havoc with our um, invisible hand. So price setting mechanism is not working anymore in an environment when you've got inflation of, tra of traffic and volumes. So for the price review also needs to be taking place for obvious reason, because fraud has played with all of that. So some of the things to be done. Yeah, we're doing very well Sorry, with time. Maybe just to pick up on that point, one of the discussions we, we have internally with the engineers who, who run our, our smishing protection service is th there is a, a paradox there where there's no financial incentive for some players in the market to, to actually block because you don't get paid for blocking SMSs, you get paid for delivering them. So is there a you know a new paradigm for you know charging for blocking? Um, it's not really for us, we're a software company, it's more for the industry to discuss, but it is a kind of an intellectual debate we have in, internally within OpenMind. Oh, we, we, we like that debate. We like debates. We, we'll follow on that. And we're supposed to be running, but okay, let's try one more question. Can you, can you give 30 seconds answer? Say sure. yes. Sure. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. 30 <laughs> seconds. They promise. So I'll go, Paul. Uh, this is Fabio from Aurelian. Uh, again, on uh, AIT, I was discussing with some uh, of my peers in the market, of course, and then uh, they came to me with a very, uh, I thought it was really interesting <coughs> the way that you put this. Um, they came to me and said, listen, do you really think that Meta cannot control who is a bot and who is not, or Google cannot control, uh, I mean, considering, of course, the, the, the technology around the mobile ID. So my question to you guys is, do you think that the AIT life cycle will last? I mean, how long will we still see AIT considering that uh, those are the big techs in the market and potentially they will be pretty soon able to control who is a bot or who is not and what is artificially generated what is not? Yeah, I mean, well, first off, one of the types of AIT we see occurs downstream from them. So completely external to their infrastructure is being generated in transit yet they are bearing the financial consequence. So I think that alone means it will continue to run until such point that they're not in, the likes of, let's say, Google and Microsoft are not involved in the money chain. And that's disastrous for all of us. Yeah, I think that's the danger. I think it just, it just shifts away from the likes of SMS or you know stuff that benefits us from a, from a financial perspective. Um, one of the things I would say is, I mean, it is interesting to see the one thing that is constant is, is change. Like we've seen in, in some uh, forms of kind of fraud protection where once we've implemented software and implemented mitigation, um, the behavior stops, uh, the attacks stop and they move markets. In smishing in particular, we think that's really an intractable problem. In some markets, they just double down. The cost of the resources, you know, uh, web domain registration, uh, you'll be able to send a message hosting. They're so cheap, they just cycle through those resources. Literally every two minutes, they'll just, they'll just dump them. and 
you know, because the resource becomes so cheap. So it, the behaviors can, can depend on the, the individual attack, yeah. They gave truth to their 30 seconds. So I think we will ask you a double round of applause for uh, Simeon <laughs> and Paul. Thank you very much.